Okay, um, what I'm going to do here is, I'm, I'm going to use this in the spirit of a workshop. So I've, um, I've written a paper and I'm going to rush through the content of that quite quickly. And then I'm going to start talking about some of the things that I don't like about what I've written. And um, why um, ideas I have for improving upon them. Uh, which will hopefully um, in, uh, provoke some discussion later on um, during the day with, with some of you. Um, so just to start with some reflections about the outcomes of the first couple of workshops. There are lots of different types of systems that have been discussed. And there we go. Um, talk of different types of open-ended evolution in that uh, first workshop report. Um, so the question is, is it possible or productive to consider all of these systems under a single framework? Um, are there any consistent features shared by all of them? Uh, is there a core idea of open-ended evolution, or are they really different things? Um, I believe that there is a core. That's certainly uh, my working hypothesis. So my approach is to try and focus on the kinds of requirements um, that constitute that core as a, as a way to categorize different types of system. Uh, so what I'm presenting just now is a development of things I've, <coughs> I've published before, so a, a refinement. I think it's quite a, a big refinement. Um, it seems I'm publishing things every three years, so um, uh, yeah, 2021 Prague should be good. Um, okay, so very quickly, um, so I'm going to present a, a high-level conceptual framework, um, which I think is useful to help um, sort of, uh, locate open-endedness within the wider literature of um, theoretical biology and other fields. Um, so I, I start by defining three different kinds of open-endedness. Now, this is not my work. I'm just stating a definition as proposed in that paper by Banshaf and colleagues that I uh, mentioned at the start. Um, I'm going to introduce a formalism to describe the key processes of evolution. And that's really, what I'm trying to do there is, is really to make explicit the fact that evolution does not just happen in individuals, but it happens embedded in an environment with other organisms around and with, in a physical environment which has its own dynamics. Um, using the formalism, I'm going to investigate those processes and interactions between them and uh, how they can lead to open-endedness, um, particularly which type of open-endedness. Um, I'm going to make a distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic implementations. And this kind of leads to some interesting revelations which I want to get onto uh, later on. So, um, okay. Right, types of open-endedness. So, um, yeah, Van Tepp and all uh, wrote this paper, um, and I'm just going to recap what they said. And it take, it's taken me quite a, a while to get round to their way of thinking. So uh, if you don't agree with what I'm about to say, then go and read their paper and um, see what you think. So their, their concept is based around this idea of... Um, any system behavior can be described as a, a descriptive model. Um, the model is expressed in terms of a set of concepts. These concepts are themselves described by a meta-model. So the meta-model describes a set of concepts which can be used to build a variety of specific models um, that use the same concepts in different ways. So this gives rise to three different kinds of open-endedness. Um, the first is um, perhaps the most boring. Um, I'm using slightly different terms to bounce up and all, but um, I'll, I, I explain why in the paper. Um, so the first I'm calling exploratory open-endedness. That's where you've got a fixed system described by a fixed model, and uh, you're, um, you're finding novelties, so new solutions within the fixed system. Um, so exploratory open-endedness is just the ongoing production of adaptive exploratory novelties as you explore this uh, fixed possibility space. So one uh, example might be a, a new combination of alleles in a, a genome. Uh, things get a bit more interesting with the next uh, type, which I'm calling expansive open-endedness. And that's when uh, you find a novelty uh, which requires you to, uh, to make a new model um, 
describe this system with a new model. But the new model still fits within the meta model of the system. So um, it's still using concepts in the meta model, um, but not the same concepts that were used in the original model. So an example of this might be a new species arising, evolving from an existing genus, or maybe a, a new chemical species um, evolving in a, a metabolism. And then finally, uh, the third and possibly most interesting um, type is transformational open-endedness. Now here you get a novelty arising which you can't even explain in the meta model. So uh, to describe the new system requires you to not only create a new model, but a new meta model of the system. So an example might be a, a major transition in individuality, where the, the concept of what it is to be an individual um, is totally different to how it was before. So th there are the definitions. I'm, not, I'm just going to take those as read. What I'm going to say in the rest of it doesn't really strictly hang upon these. And there, there are other people. Margaret Bowden, for example, has, has stated quite similar ideas in a slightly different way. Um, but this is what I'm using. So uh, onto my formalism, um, just to make explicit a few relationships um, that are present in, in any evolutionary system. Um, a process of generation from uh, sort of a genetic description of an individual to a, a phenotypic behavior. Now, so these processes may or may not be more or less explicitly present in any system, but, um, but these, these are the general things which uh, you might f find to some extent in, in any system. So you generate the phenotypes, then you have some process of evaluation to uh, evaluate from an <coughs> evolutionary perspective um, their worth, as it were. And then from, from the ones which get through that, um, that sieve of evaluation, uh, they then reproduce and create a new generation of individuals, which it doesn't obviously have to be synchronous like this, but um, that's just how I've shown it here. So generation. Um, so, this is how I'm representing it. Um, so, M is a mapping um, from genotype to phenotype. So, so, G is the genotype, P is the resultant phenotype, M is the mapping. Uh, the subscript L represents that this is happening um, in a system with fixed global laws acting upon the system, which aren't described uh, explicitly in the mapping. And there's also context, so there's an abiotic con um, conditions and biotic conditions in which the mapping unfolds. Um, just to give you an example of L in action, so as Hiroki already said, or Howard I should say, uh, self-organisational processes arising from laws of physics and chemistry in the biosphere, or um, as Rod was saying earlier, CPU interpretation of instructions in our Tierra, so it's not just a programme, but to, um, to understand behavior, you have to understand the whole system, um, including the hardware. So the process of evaluation, um, I'm representing like this. So E is your sort of the mapping process, but there are a lot of factors involved. Again, it takes place within a, a, a system with fixed uh, global laws. Um, again, you've got context from local abiotic and biotic conditions. And uh, the way I'm representing the results of evaluation in, in a general way uh, by this, uh, this triplet here um, is, I mean, don't take this too seriously, but it's kind of um, trying to, to bring out the important factors. So L is the resultant lifetime of, a, of the individual phenotype. SR is what I'm calling the reproduction schedule. So that determines when the individual gets to reproduce and uh, how many times it, it reproduces. And PM is a, uh, is a mate set, so, um, <coughs> which uh, determines through the individual's behavior um, whether it combines with other individuals um, in reproducing. So that mate set may be empty for um, asexual species, or it may um, have one or, or more um, other organisms as members. Okay, and just an example again of L in action here. So um, the laws of aerodynamics, for example, um, determining the ability of a bird to fly. So that's um, one example of, of how the evaluation 
um, of an individual is partially determined by laws of physics. And finally, reproduction with variation. Um, again, just go through this. We've seen these symbols, most of these before. Um, so R is the reproduction <coughs> mapping, um, but this makes use of the uh, reproduction schedule as determined by the evaluation, um, and also the mate set also as determined by the uh, evaluation. Um, and again, this is happening within the context of a physical or a, a, an environment of some sort. I say, I say physical environment, but it's not necessarily physical. Um, so the, the same considerations uh, apply to computational universes too. Uh, and so, for example, the specification of global mutation rates is, is one thing that um, uh, the global laws will determine there. So, how do I, what, what use is all of this? Uh, well, so I, I, I'm putting it all together um, to see how these uh, determine um, what kinds of open-endedness um, arise in the system. First of all, I want to say a quick comment about intrinsic versus extrinsic implementations. Um, so this is a cross-cutting issue in the quest for open-endedness. Extrinsic processes are hard-coded mechanisms um, defined externally. So, for example, you may have a mutation mechanism that's de just defined in the system outside of the, um, of the evolving uh, individuals themselves. Whereas intrinsic processes implemented through components and dynamics in the system themselves, and so they allow the possibility that the implementation, the process, um, might change and evolve itself. So, the importance of uh, an intrinsic evaluation process has been recognized for a long time. In fact, Norman uh, wrote a paper about this uh, 30 years ago. Um, and uh, so, just raising the point, which is uh, appreciated by some, but not always, that uh, the same applies to the generation and reproduction processes too. So, um, the extent to which um, reproduction and mutation and um, crossover is able to evolve um, is determined by the extent to which those processes are implemented actually within the system itself rather than being hard-coded. Okay, so here's kind of the, uh, uh, the um, point of what I've been saying up to now. You can put all of these things together I've got two organisms here, I'm representing those, those three processes, the mapping from genotype to phenotype, evaluation of the phenotype, and then the production of, of new individuals um, from selected uh, phenotypes. Um, now, what you can do here is start to look at how interactions and how um, uh, intrinsic implementations of each of these processes um, maps onto various concepts in the literature. So, for example, if we look at um, number three there, um, if the phenotype determines the M uh, process, that's an evolvable genotype phenotype map. Um, or we're looking at one there, evolvable genetic operators, um, and number two, engineering, <coughs> uh, environment engineering and niche construction. So, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of exploratory open-endedness, so the first kind of open-endedness, just being able to continually move about in a possibility space, um, what you need and what is well understood is having a, um, a, a changing adaptive landscape. So that's having a, a changing process of evaluation. So that's the middle process here. So we're interested in the <coughs> things which affect that middle process. And so things like uh, route 2, environment engineering and niche construction, and route 6 and 7, um, indirect ecological relationships and uh, direct co-evolutionary arm races. Those kind of things affect the evaluation process and therefore uh, change the fitness landscape and keep the system moving. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these now, but, um, but do read the paper if, if you're interested in that. I was sort of quite happy with how all, the, all of these things turned out, and it sort of acts as a nice 
picture in which you can hang all these different concepts um, from the literature um, in one place. However, there are some, uh, there are some uh, problems with it. Um, so I did all of this, and then I figured out, well, hang on, all of these routes relate to exploratory open-endedness, just the, the first example that I showed with the same model. It doesn't say anything about the more interesting kind of open-endedness. So, expansive and transformational open-endedness, um, these involve these door-opening events, so these red explosions here, they're, they're the key to the more interesting kinds of open-endedness. And there are two important questions there. Where does this extra space of possibilities come from, and how can the evolutionary access the new states via intrinsic mechanisms? Um, so question one, in the biological world, as uh, Hiroki was saying, this extra space was always there. We're starting off with a, a really complicated environment, and it's just um, a matter of biological systems evolving to make use of that existing complexity. Um, and it's interesting to note that the most impressive instances of uh, transformational novelties in artificial systems are found in physical systems. So in works such as um, Pask um, and Cariani's work where they're evolving sort of an ear or uh, something capable of uh, responding to sound or Bird and Lazel's work where they evolved a kind of radio that could respond to electromagnetic uh, radiation. In computational systems, um, you can do the same thing. You can start off with a very rich environment, um, so that's also an option. Um, but another option is to dynamically increase the possibility space as the system unfolds. Um, so uh, Ken Stanley's Pick Breeder, for example, is an example of this. It's a system open to the internet. People can interact and build upon it um, and increase the possibility space as the system proceeds. Um, okay, so question two. How, how do the process... How can the process um, access new states intrinsically? In the physical world, again, as Hiroki already mentioned, there are, there's this concept of um, different domains. Um, so physical systems have multiple properties in different domains, mechanical, chemical, electrical, all of that. Um, components can act as trans-domain bridges. So um, do, in the process of acceptation, um, a component uh, selected for a property in one domain might have other useful properties in other domains which may become the process of selection. Um, so perhaps the distinction between expansive and transformational novelty can be viewed as the difference between door opening novelty in the same domain versus door opening novelty in a different domain. Um, okay, I'm just going to rush a bit to get through some of this. Um, Another way in which new states can be uh, uh, discovered is through comp compositional systems. Um, so often in, in uh, evolutionary systems, you, you're building structures out of uh, components drawn, drawn from a set of components, such as proteins from amino acids, um, neural networks from neurons. But there can be two different types of compositional systems. That, um, it can be purely additive. So, for example, if you've got a load of batteries and you join them together in serial, you just get, it's still a battery, but just with a greater voltage. Um, but the more interesting ones are non-additive, um, where there's a possibility that building up something compositionally gives you something completely different. Uh, so, for example, a neural network a, or a computer program, you, you put um, the components together, and you might get a completely different behavior. Um, Future work, okay, so I don't have time to say any of this, but I'm just going to say perhaps um, the, the picture of phenotype or genotype to phenotype is far too simplistic, what I've presented here. And I think there's a lot more, this is probably where there's a, uh, a, a great need of um, extra work from, and I have ideas about this, expanding this idea of how you get from a parameter space to a structure and then to an interaction and behavior. And I think there's a lot of work in um, philosophy of biology and also in Howard Patti's work um, about this notion of what behavior is. And it's not just a fixed thing, but it's an interaction um, with the laws of physics and with other systems. 
And so my, my project for taking this work forward is to continue this idea of trying to um, <coughs> encompass the dynamics of the environment and interactions with other, um, with other individuals, um, but bring, bring that right down to the notion of what it is to behave. And I think that's a, a way for answering how new behaviours come into the system. In the paper, I discuss just how you can use this framework to classify existing systems in terms of which processes, which of those three processes are implemented intrinsically or ent extrinsically. That gives you some idea of um, how, um, where the weaknesses are in individual um, systems. And so just to summarize, yeah, the formalism only helps with exploratory open-endedness and for, it's interesting that the, for the more interesting kinds of open-endedness we have to consider not the kind of things that are generally considered in um, population biology and evolution but actually the laws and properties of the environment and um, the nature of the building blocks at which individual or organisms are constructed. I'll stop there, thank you. I think we should do what we did the last time. So if you have questions, then please come up and then you can use the microphone. So while you are getting organized, maybe I'll ask a question. So I, I think this is a, a really interesting conclusion um, because I, I agree with you that, that maybe this uh, phenotype, or, sorry, genotype, phenotype way of thinking about evolution is insufficient it, 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 for, for getting a grab, uh, if you want to grapple with uh, uh, with uh, open-ended evolution, so 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 that's a conclusion of what you're saying, right? Yes. That you need to you need to include the environment. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so I agree with that. Okay. So, uh, so you talk about some paths of uh, to achieve it, and also you talk about some operators, mm -hmm. and you describe that there's initiation and there's a reproduction and then there's selection. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you try to if you look at nature and then there's there's not, there's no such a thing as selection. Uh, I mean, at some point there was initiation, happened once, as long as you probably know, and there's always reproduction and selection is something that's observed a posteriori. So if you happen to succeed in, in reproduction and then you observe, oh look, ah, this was selected. And then, yes. uh, so maybe one of the paths, or have you thought of the, one of the paths might be attaching this uh, open-endedness to reproduction itself? Um. Okay, so I... So when, when, when I um, say that there's a selection operator, um, or yeah, evaluation, um, I, the whole point of putting uh, L in there, so there's, that's the laws of, of the environment, that's, and, and also the context of the um, other organisms, um, and also the local sort of abiotic environment. Um, I was trying to capture just this thing that it, it might be, it's not necessarily an explicit thing that has been um, extrinsically defined, but it may be. Um, so I was, what I was aiming for that was that this, process, this formalism would capture the notion of natural selection as well as um, artificial selection. So yeah, I mean, I agree with you, and I've, that was what I, I don't know to what extent I've succeeded, but I was trying to, to capture that possibility too. Okay, so let, let's do it really quickly, see if we can get through the line. Okay, so one of the things that occurs to me with the intrinsicness of evaluation um, is whenever one writes down something that identifies the members of the formalism, then you're kind of committing to a certain frame uh, to view it in, and so then it's hard to make transitions between scales. I wonder how you could basically adapt this kind of approach to something like endophysics, where you have to acknowledge that from an intrinsic point of view, actually you can't distinguish between different sets of global laws. Right. Um, I, okay. Um, I mean, I, I absolutely agree with you, and I'm not... I mean, maybe... So this is... Um, this is a, a way of... Um, I guess I was, I was trying to... Um, use this as a way of, of bringing together different concepts from the literature and I'm not thinking of this as a, a way you would go and sort of build a system. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. One of the um, 
sort of problems with, with the most existing systems is that you do start off with a, a hardwired notion of what, um, what an organism is. And it's this whole question of extrinsic versus intrinsic implementation. So, in fact, yes, yeah, so to answer your question, the, what, for open-endedness, you really need an intrinsic notion of selection. Is that what you, yes, yeah, so or all, all of these processes really need to be intrinsic. So, defined within the system themselves rather than some external.